Yeah, and my excuse for having 2017 up here is that I can't believe it's January. So I keep having to remind myself what month it is because it's amazing how climate and weather can make you so disoriented. But yeah, my, my first winter in a place this warm. So I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about native bees. So this is my area of expertise. I'll be sharing with you a little bit about pollination and pollinators more broadly, um, but really focusing in on the wild bees in North America. So bees have been in the news a lot in the last few years. And some of you have maybe seen headlines like this. I just pulled a few from the internet in the most recent years. For example, nation's beekeepers lost 44% of bees in 2015 to 2016. But we also see conflicting messages like call off the bee apocalypse, US honeybee colonies hit a 20 year high. Uh, so the messages are not always that consistent, um, but we certainly do see a lot of messages that make us concerned for bees and pollinators more broadly. And it's not just honeybees. There are headlines like more than 700 North American bee species are headed toward extinction. Uh, but again, conflicting headlines that claim bees are just fine, dissecting some of the myths or some of the untruths associated with bee declines. So I'm hoping today to talk to you a little bit about native bees, their biology, share some fun facts. Uh, I'll also be talking about identifying bees, and uh, we'll do a short little interactive bee identification quiz if you're all up for it. Uh, and then I'll move from that into talking about pollinator and bee declines. Are they declining? What do we know about those declines? And then I'll end on a more positive note and talk a bit about conservation. Not only conservation at a national and state level, but conservation at a local level too, in your backyard, for example. So basically, those are the three parts, starting with the importance of pollinators, narrowing in on bees specifically to talk about their biology and some fun facts, then talk about uh, bee declines and the threats that bees face to their populations, not just now but in the future, and ending with bee conservation. So what is pollination? What are pollinators? Why should we care? Well, pollination is a process, and it's a process by which flowering plants reproduce. So for these plants to reproduce, pollen needs to move from the male reproductive organs, the anthers, to the female reproductive organs, the stigmas. That's where fertilization occurs. This is plant reproduction, so fertilization occurs there. And that process not only allows plants to reproduce and plant populations to thrive, but also gives us fruits, seeds, nuts, and provides those same things for other animals, not just humans. So this process, this movement, this pollination, can happen by a lot of different agents. Some of them are abiotic or non-living, like gravity, agitation, and wind, but it also happens via animals. And in fact, this group of plants, the flowering plants, about 80% of them require animals to move pollen. So that other 20% is going to depend mostly on things like wind, gravity, and agitation, but a large majority require some kind of animal to move pollen. And this may be because the pollen is too heavy to be moved adequately by wind, or the plants are dispersed such that animals are really the best agent to move that pollen across those distances. And this process is really important for our global food supply. So an interesting study in 2007 found that of the leading 115 crops grown worldwide, 87 of them depended to some degree on animal pollinators. And this, uh, these 87 here made up about 35% of crop production worldwide. So you might wonder, well, 87 is, is a majority, so why is, why is it only a third? Well, that's because some of these crops um, that do not require animal pollinators are things like grains, wheat, corn, rice, and those, as you may know, are grown on very large scales. So a lot of the crops that do require pollination are grown on smaller scales. We don't produce as much of them, but there are a large number, and they do make up about a third of the agricultural, uh, global agricultural production. And these animal pollinators are estimated to be worth 18 to 27 billion dollars. So many of these crops that do require animal pollinators are expensive crops, and they're also very nutritious. So things like blueberries, almonds, so without animal pollinators uh, and some way to pollinate, to take the place of those animal pollinators, our diet would be much reduced. We would lose a lot of those nutritious fruits, vegetables, 
nuts, seeds, etc. But as I mentioned, pollinators are not just important in agriculture, they're also important in natural habitats. So in natural habitats, these pollinators maintain plant diversity. Many plants rely on these animal pollinators, and if they were to disappear or not exist, those plant populations would not thrive. And these seeds and fruit that result from pollination don't just feed us humans, but they also feed a lot of birds, mammals, and other animals. Uh, so it's important to, to have pollinators around, not just for our own benefit, but for the diet of other animals as well. So there are many things that pollinate, and I'll be talking today about bees, specifically wild bees, but I just want to give credit to a variety of animals that pollinate. So we have vertebrate pollinators, um, things like birds, also bats, and then we have a variety of invertebrate pollinators, including, uh, this is a fly here, and we have moths and butterflies also at the, up at the top, and then we also have some beetles. So Ants as well can pollinate, so a variety of insects pollinate, and there are also vertebrate pollinators like birds uh, and bats as well. So basically, to be a pollinator, the animal just has to visit a flower, uh, and many things visit flowers. So if you're out in your garden and you look, you'll see a lot of different organisms, a lot of different animals visiting flowers, and those can all act as pollinators. They may not be intentionally collecting pollen, but they could accidentally get pollen on their bodies and then transfer the pollen the next time they visit a flower. So of these animals, bees are arguably the most important on a global scale. They are abundant and diverse. They're present everywhere. There are flowering plants. And they're also the only group of organisms that uniformly collect pollen to feed their young. So as I mentioned, a lot of these other organisms are visiting flowers. They're visiting to drink a little nectar. They need a little sugar while they're flying around, while they're searching for other food, while they're reproducing. So they go to just get a quick little fix of nectar, a quick little fix of sugar, but they're not actively collecting pollen. Bees, on the other hand, are actively collecting that pollen to feed their young. And so they have specialized structures to do that, like branched hairs all over their body. So they're very good at collecting pollen and depositing pollen. Uh, many of them also exhibit floral constancy or fidelity. So this means that they're faithful to a certain group of plants or even a certain species of plant. And uh, that can make them very good pollinators because they'll select that one particular group or species of plant uh, and pollinate or enable that plant to reproduce. So what is a bee? Well, bees are insects. Uh, they are related to wasps and ants. Um, and in that group, there are many other social organisms. So that group contains a lot of social organisms. They are identified by having two pairs of wings. So I'll talk a little bit about how you can distinguish bees from other insects. Not all insects have two pairs of wings, but bees do. So bees all have two pairs of wings. And they have these pollen-carrying hairs for the most part. There are some exceptions to this. There are some bees that carry pollen internally. There are others called cuckoo bees that go and steal pollen from other bees' nests. So they don't have to collect it themselves. They don't have to have the hairs. They just go and steal it from other bees. Uh, but for the majority that are actively collecting pollen off of flowers, they have these pollen-carrying hairs. And they also are sort of unified by all having a diet of pollen and nectar. So these are the things that are true of all, or at least the majority, of bees. In contrast, in contrast Wasps are carnivorous, so they feed their young other animals, other insects, other arthropods. The adults will drink a little bit of nectar to supplement their diet when they're flying around, and that's why you'll sometimes see them at flowers, but they're not actively collecting that pollen. Uh, wasps include yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps, and they can be identified. There's a great variety of forms and colors in wasps, but for the most part, they're relatively hairless in contrast to bees. They often have bright coloration. And this coloration is not on the hair, as it is often in bees, but it's on the skin or integument itself. So here you can see this wasp has this bright sort of orangish red. And this is not um, orange or red on the hair, but actually on the skin or the integument. They're also, in contrast to bees, relatively thin. And many of them have this thin waist right here. So there are also flies, which are often confused for bees. And they're often confused for bees because many of them mimic bees. So they're intentionally trying to confuse, maybe not you, but trying to confuse other uh, living creatures. 
So these bee mimics, this is an example of one, they have that coloration of a bee, um, but they can be identified by having only a single pair of wings. That's often hard to see unless you're looking at something under a microscope. But many of them have these sort of large bulging eyes, which are more obvious. And for at least the ones that mimic bees, they have short antennae. So this is not true for all flies. For example, mosquitoes do not have short antennae. But the ones that are mimicking uh, the bees have these sort of short, um, stubbly antennae. Uh, they will also visit flowers, and so they can act as pollinators, but they're typically uh, not as good for the majority of flowers as bees are in pollinating. Okay, so I've gone over uh, some things that may be confused with bees, most notably wasps and flies. So I just want you to take a second, you can talk with your neighbor, you don't have to talk with your neighbor, um, to look at these pictures and try to pick out the bees and the non-bees. And then, and then we'll go over which ones are bees and which ones aren't. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you got to think about at least a few of them. Uh, all right, so did I, how many people think this is a bee? Raise your hand if you think it's a bee. All right, so this is a wasp. Uh, and it's relatively hairless. It has some bright coloration. Uh, most notably, it doesn't have hairs on the legs. Uh, it has spurs, which actually help it to collect prey. So you can see these little spiny things all along the legs instead of hairs. So that is a wasp. What about this one? Raise your hand if you think that's a bee. Fly, all right, yeah. So this is a fly. You can see it has bulging eyes, shorter antennae. This is very similar to that bee mimic we saw earlier. Um, this, anyone know what this is? Yeah, bee, all right, so I have some hands, yeah. Okay, so this is a bee, this is the honeybee, the European honeybee. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about honeybees versus other bees. Uh, so what about this? Raise your hand if you think that's a bee. All right, so this is probably the hardest um, of the images up here, in my opinion, but some of you did raise your hand, so this is a bee. Uh, it has a lot of hairs on the legs. So again, if you look for those hairs on the legs, um, that's one of the defining features of most bees. Also, its eyes do not take up the whole head. It has longer antennae. It does have bright coloration, though. So I know I told you that uh, often that bright coloration is more associated with wasps than bees. But there are some bees that have metallic green coloration, as well as some bright yellow. So uh, often you have to put all the different characteristics together, um, and it's a bit of a learning curve. So what about this? Raise your hand if you think this is a bee. All right, so yep, this is a wasp. Uh, also has a lot of the same characteristics as that wasp. So this one? All right, so we're getting mixed. Yeah, so this is a bee. Uh, it also has not only hair on the legs, but you can actually see the hair a little more visibly on the thorax and head. So it has quite a lot of hair. Um, the legs are also enlarged. Uh, and in contrast to, say, wasps, which often have very thin legs, um, it does have kind of a metallic coloration. It's metallic blue, a metallic navy blue. So there are some bees that are metallic green, and then there are others that are metallic navy blue. Um, this one down here, yeah, this is a pretty obvious bee. A lot of hair on the legs, pollen collecting hair. Uh, and this is a little bit tricky. Yeah, so here's some flies, yeah. So this is a fly. Um, so this one's, this one's pretty hairy. Yeah, so <laughs> this one's pretty hairy, but it does have the bulging eyes. So these eyes here are taking um, over pretty much the whole head. So it has the bulging eyes. 
The antennae you can't see very well, but they are the sort of shorter stubbly antennae. They end about there. Uh, and it only has one pair of, of wings. But again, that's a little bit hard to see on most specimens. Um, and uh, it does have a lot of hair. So it's, it's difficult. But the point of that was to get across that there are, is a large diversity in color, in shape, uh, in form among the bees. And bees are often confused with other things like flies and wasps. So it's, it is difficult. So bees, I like to split bees up uh, between managed bees and non-managed bees. And the most common managed bee worldwide is the honeybee. So in the US, we have a single species of honeybee, Apis mellifera, and this is the European honeybee. So as its name suggests, it's not native to the United States. It's native to Europe and parts of Asia. Uh, so it's non-native, single species in the US. It's managed, but there are also feral or wild colonies. So it has escaped and it's established feral colonies, uh, particularly in warmer or more temperate parts like Florida. There are a lot of feral and wild colonies. So this is a social bee. There's a queen, uh, drones or males, and workers. So there's division of reproduction and division of labor. Different bees have different roles within the colony. And these colonies are perennial, so they can live for many years. And this bee is also a generalist, so it visits a variety of plants. And that makes it a very good crop pollinator. So it um, can pollinate a number of crops because it does visit a large variety of plants. But in addition to this single species of managed bee, we have a lot of wild bees in North America, over 4,000 estimated species in North America of uh, native wild bees. And these bees ha have a range of behaviors, a range of sociality, a range of foraging, and a range of nesting behaviors. And I'll just talk briefly about it. Obviously, I can't go into every single species. We would be here for who knows how long, but I'll give you an overview of the variety of behaviors. So these bees are also effective pollinators. And in fact, a few species have been domesticated or commercialized. So for example, the eastern, common eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens, uh, you can actually purchase that and use that for pollination. It's often used in greenhouses for pollination of crops like tomato, but it's also used in the field. So there are a few of these species that have been commercialized or domesticated, but for the most part, they exist in the wild. They don't produce any significant honey production. So uh, bumblebees, for example, will produce some, but not enough to make it worth anyone's while to uh, domesticate or commercialize them for honey. Um, so we do rely on the honeybee for honey. Uh, we don't use any of these bees for honey. But we can use them for crop pollination, and they are important in pollinating crops. So in terms of their behaviors, they have a wide range of nesting behaviors. So many of them nest below ground in cavities, but some of them nest above ground. And these bees that nest above ground, some of them utilize existing structures, so hollow stems or reeds, abandoned birds or abandoned rodent nests uh, or beetle burrows. Others will actually excavate their own nests. So carpenter bees, for example, will chew uh, their own nests or cavities in wood. So they actually excavate their own nests. So the majority nest below ground, and this is often surprising to people that uh, many of these bees are nesting below ground. And so they dig um, these tunnels here. So many of, of these bees that nest below ground uh, are called mining bees. So mining bees are a particular group of below ground nesting bees, and they will nest um, at quite great depths below ground, so up to a couple meters below ground. And they uh, have these long tunnels, and then they have offshoots where they will lay pollen nectar balls and then lay their eggs on top of that. The larvae eat the pollen and nectar. They go through metamorphosis below ground, and then they emerge as adults. So a minority, about 30%, nest above ground. And as I mentioned, some of these utilize already existing structures. Others will excavate structures. So many of them nest in things like stems or reeds. So these are sort of long, linear structures. And in these long, linear structures, they'll uh, build a sequence of cells. So this bee here is using mud to partition the cells. So these are little mud walls that partition each of the cells. And in each cell, the mother will put a pollen mass. And on top of that, she'll lay an egg. This will develop uh, into a larva that will consume the pollen mass and then go through metamorphosis. So here's a picture of a bunch of cocoons, so metamorphosizing bees, 
And when they become adults, these bees will leave the nest and go off to start their own nests. So again, this bee is using mud. So this is a, a mason bee because she uses mud. So she's using mud to partition her cells. But other bees use leaves or petals to make their cells. So this bee here has used petals to make a cylindrical cell. In each of these cells, she'll produce or she'll put a pollen ball on top of which she'll lay that egg. And so you can imagine these cylindrical cells here all lined up in some kind of long linear cavity, like a reed. And this is a picture of a bee that uses leaves. So again, they can use leaves, petals, mud. This bee is using leaves. So this is a, a leaf cutter bee. And uh, this bee uses her mandibles, uh, sort of her jaw, to cut leaves. And if you uh, go looking in a garden, sometimes you can actually see little perfect circles cut out of the leaves. And that's the leaf cutter bee, cutting these leaves. And she'll put the leaves together to form a cell. And again, she'll have that pollen ball inside the cell, and she'll lay the egg on top of that pollen ball. As I mentioned, some bees will use abandoned rodents or birds' nests. Bumblebees are a good example of that. So they often use abandoned rodent nests. So their nests are uh, more like a big circular mound. Um, and so they will use a, a mound of some sort, like a rodent nest. And their colonies will be inside there. So this is a, a picture of a bumblebee colony. You can see many workers around the colony. And so most bees are solitary. The exception to this are bumblebees, and I'll talk about those in, an, in a second. There are also a few other exceptions. Uh, some sweat bees are social. But the majority of bees are solitary. And so in this case, every single female adult bee will establish her own nest. So she will create a cell, put a pollen ball, lay an egg, the larva will develop, go through metamorphosis, become an adult, and then that bee will create her own cell. So there's no division of reproduction, there's no division of labor. Every female has her own cell. Uh, bumblebees are an example of social bees. So bumblebees are just a small fraction of those 4,300 species. So a very small fraction. The majority are solitary, but bumblebees are social. These differ from honeybees, however, in that they're annual colonies. So each colony only lives for a year. And so the life cycle looks a little bit like this. In the winter, you have a queen that's hibernating. She's hunkering below ground. In the spring, she emerges, and she starts to collect pollen and nectar. She produces a cohort of workers in the spring or the summer. And then throughout the summer, she'll produce a few more cohorts of workers. So early in the spring, she has to go out and collect the pollen or nectar. She doesn't have any workers to do that for her. But after she produces workers, then those workers are what collect the pollen and nectar for the next batch of workers. When fall comes around, that queen dies. And not just the queen, but all of the workers in the colony die. So the entire colony pretty much shuts down. The only bees that leave are the new queens. So that colony has produced some amount of new queens. So those new queens leave. Males also leave. The new queens and the males mate. The males subsequently die, so they also die that fall. And only the new queens overwinter to start nests the next year. So they're, they're annual short-lived colonies. And in terms of their foraging, different bee taxa or groups have different foraging periods. And some specialize on certain types of plants, while others are more generalists. So this is just a graph of different uh, bee genera, different taxa or groups, and their foraging periods. This is in Canada, so it's going to look a little bit different here in Florida, but it gives you an idea. Some um, have foraging periods of two to three months, whereas others, bombus are bumblebees, they'll forage throughout much of the year. And the ones that forage over longer periods, like bombus or some of these sweat bees here, Halictus and Lazia glossum are sweat bees, they're uh, mostly generalists, so most of these species will forage on a variety of plants. Uh, the bees that have shorter foraging periods include many specialists, so their emergence is timed with the bloom of those plants that they specialize on. But as you can imagine, if you're a bee that's foraging over a long period of time, or a species that's foraging over a long period of time, you have to be flexible. You can't only forage on a single plant, species, or group, because it's not likely to bloom for that entire period. So those long foraging bees tend to be more generalist, and ones with shorter foraging periods may specialize on certain plants. 
All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of the diversity of behaviors uh, in bees. They're a very fascinating group, and I've only kind of touched the surface of, of some of those behaviors. But I want to move on to talk a little bit about pollinator declines. And again, when talking about pollinator declines, I think it's important to specify whether one's talking about the honeybee, other bees, or other pollinators. So, for example, monarchs. Uh, many of you have probably heard about concerns over monarch populations. I'm not going to talk about those other pollinators, um, but I'll focus mostly on the European honeybee and other bees, and between these two, mostly on this sort of other bee category. But there uh, is reason to be concerned for some of these other pollinators, like monarchs, certainly. So in terms of the European honeybee, this is a graph that's produced by um, an organization that keeps track of national honeybee colony numbers. And so this shows honeybee colony losses over the last decade plus. And every year, uh, there's a sort of average or acceptable loss. So honeybee colonies, they are perennial, but they won't live forever. And so there's some acceptable amount of loss. And for this um, overwintering loss, loss during the winter, that acceptable level is about 15%. But as you can see, winter losses in this yellow here exceeded that acceptable amount uh, and have done so for over the past decade. Although the trend is getting a little bit better. So you can see these overwintering losses were particularly high here uh, and it's gotten a little bit better in more recent years. And then this orange bar shows total annual loss. So bee colonies uh, don't just die over the winter, but they have been, especially in recent years, been dying off at other times during the year as well. So these orange bars show that total annual loss, at least for the past few years. And in some cases, that is up to 45%. So that's where that headline, 44% of honeybee colonies lost that I first showed, that's where that's coming from. But again, it is a little bit confusing because there is some acceptable amount of loss. So when someone says, oh, honeybee colony died, or I lost some amount of honeybee colonies, that, that is a natural phenomenon that's expected to occur. But what's important is to look at how high those losses are relative to how high they've been in the past, and whether that trend is getting better or getting worse. So there are a variety of causes that could be contributing to honeybee colony losses. Pests, in particular mites. And pests have always been a problem, but that problem can increase or decrease in magnitude. Pests can develop resistance to pesticides, making it harder to control them. And so they can become more of a problem over time, which has happened with some of these honeybee pests. There are also diseases. And again, this is always a problem, but there can be new strains of diseases. Uh, if honeybee immunity is lower or honeybee colony health is lower, they might not be able to fight off those pathogens as well as they had in the past. So diseases have always been a problem, but they can be uh, more or less a problem depending on other factors. Pesticides and other environmental toxins are of concern, and I'll talk a little bit about pesticides later. And then diet and nutrition, which, as I mentioned, can make some of these other problems worse. It can affect the health and the ability of the colony to fight off pests and pathogens and interact with pesticides and toxins. And colony collapse disorder is one particular phenomenon, um, one particular type of colony loss. And scientists still don't know exactly what causes this colony loss or phenomenon, but it's likely interactions among some of these factors. So it may not be one single factor, but interactions uh, among these different factors here. So native wild bees, are native wild bees declining? Again, the managed honeybee, that's a managed species. And so uh, we know a bit more about the numbers. We can keep track of the colonies. These native wild bees, imagine how hard it would be to keep track of 4,300 species. Uh, that's very difficult to do. So this publication uh, was produced in, recently in 2017 by the Center for Biological Diversity, and they assessed 1,400 of these 4,300 species, so only a fraction, and that's because we don't have enough information about the rest of them. But of these 1,430 or 1,437 species, they found that over half are declining. There's evidence to show that over half of those are declining. And one in four are imperiled, meaning they're declining to an extent that they may become extinct uh, and that warrants some concern. So not all are declining. Some species are doing quite well. But there is reason to be concerned about the overall diversity, where we may be losing a lot of this bee diversity. 
And this is just a headline from another recent article that uh, was published from a study in Germany that found a very large decline over an almost 30-year period in total insect biomass. So this isn't just bees, this is all flying insects. But over an almost 30-year period, they found a 75% decline. And this was actually in protected areas. So that's interesting. We're not even talking about a farm field or the middle of a city. But in protected areas, they found this relatively large decline over this long-term period. So why might bees, or insects more broadly, be declining? Uh, first, I want to show a map of bee decline in the US. So this study was produced in 2016. And the blue areas are areas which have a relatively greater bee abundance. The yellow areas are the areas that have a relatively lower bee abundance. And so if you look at this map, uh, some patterns might uh, start to emerge. Some might, might strike you. For one, these yellow areas are areas where there's a lot of farmland and or a lot of people. The blue areas are areas where population density may be lower and where farming is not uh, as much a part of the economy. All right, so causes of bee decline. I think arguably the, one of the main drivers is land use change. So again, these bees are not managed, which means we can't bring them around. We can't bring them to good habitats. Uh, we can't bring them to a food source. So when we destroy certain habitats, we're destroying the areas in which they live and reducing the resources available for them. Pesticides are also a factor, not just for the managed honeybees, but for wild bees. And these can be pesticides applied in agricultural areas, but also in urban areas or even in natural habitats. Managed bees may be contributing. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think this first one here is probably one of the bigger factors, possibly the second. These latter are factors that we don't have quite as much information on, but might be contributing, including managed bee use. Also pathogens. This uh, may be particularly important for some of the bumblebees that we see declining. Invasive plants. So invasive plants might be displacing the native plants that these bees rely on. And finally, climate change. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these and why they might be important. So land use change, you can imagine habitats like this or like this providing a lot of floral and nesting resources for bees. So the, these bees need flowers, they need flowers over their entire foraging period, and they need area to nest in, whether that's good soil if they're nesting below ground, or cavities, rodents' nests, beetle burrows if they're nesting above ground. So when we change the landscape to look like this, we may be reducing the floral and nesting resources for bees. And it's not just agriculture, uh, highly developed areas too may have limited floral and nesting resources. Although, we can also manage those areas to introduce flowers. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the conservation part. So some of my work has looked at the landscape and how that affects bees. I studied this in apple orchards. Each of these dots here represents an orchard that I worked at. And the larger circle represents a one kilometer radius around that orchard. And that's roughly the bees foraging period. So bees can move around uh, over quite large distances for insects. So individual honeybees, for example, have been found to forage over multiple kilometers. Other bees can forage over up to a kilometer. So this is a landscape a bee might be able to reach. And you could think about whether that landscape is better in a wooded area or whether a wooded landscape is better for the bee, a highly diverse landscape, or an agricultural landscape. And I actually found that it was these highly diverse landscapes that supported the greatest abundance and diversity of bees. So some amount of agriculture and some amount of woodland, the agriculture is in this brown here, and the woodland is in the green, as well as some amount of natural grassland, which is in the pink, wetland in the blue, and developed in the gray. So all of these habitat types working together provided the most floral resources and nesting resources for the bees and supported the greatest abundance and diversity of bees, at least in this area. So other studies have found that the per percentage or proportion of natural habitat is really important to support bees. So having a lot of natural habitat or having a diversity of habitat types seems to support bees, while having uh, a more homogeneous or uniform landscape, fewer land cover types, as well as more highly managed habitat, like agriculture, tends to not support as high of an abundance or diversity of bees. So pesticide use, there's one particular group of pesticides that's been in the news quite a bit, and that's neonicotinoids. 
This is a group of pesticides that really uh, didn't start to be used until the 1900s. The, so this map here shows use over time. And you can see that in 1994 there was very little use, but by 2009 much of the country uh, was using this group of pesticides. And so people often ask, well, why, why, do, why do we use this group of pesticides? Well, there are some benefits. It's very effective, less toxic to birds and mammals than many other products on the market, and it's effective longer, so you don't have to spray it as often or as many times. But the drawbacks, this group of pesticides is a systemic pesticide, meaning that it remains in the plant for a very long period of time. That it remains in the plant for a long period of time is part of what makes it effective, but it also means that it can be present in the nectar or pollen. It's been shown to have some toxicity to bees, but this depends a little bit on the dose and the context in which it's applied, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. And because it has a long residual activity, it can remain in the environment longer. So those are some of the benefits and drawbacks to this class of pesticides, which is a relatively new class. So it can be applied to plants in a variety of ways. It can be applied as seeds. So these are treated seeds, so they have that pesticide already applied. And again, I mentioned that this is a systemic pesticide, meaning that it will, if you plant these seeds, that pesticide will move up through the plant and remain, remain in the plant throughout much of its lifetime. The pesticide can also be applied into the soil, in which case it will be taken up by the plant, or it can be applied on the leaves, like these foliar sprays. So this here, again, just shows these black arrows. If you put it into the soil or plant seed-treated uh, seeds, that pesticide will move up through the plant, following these black arrows here, and be present in the pollen and nectar. If you apply it to the leaves, likewise, that pollen will move up through the plant's vascular system and be present in the pollen and nectar. So this group of pesticides in particular has been shown to have sublethal effects. So it may not outright kill the bees, but it's been shown to have some effects on their behavior. And again, this depends a little bit on which exact pesticide you're studying, the dose that it's applied at, and the bee that you're studying. So there is still some controversy about the overall effect because there are a lot of variables at play here. Uh, this was a recent study that looked at two species. This is a bumblebee species, and this is a solitary species. This is the production of queens in the different colonies, and this is the number of those reproductive cells. So those cells that can either be enclosed in leaves or petals that I showed you earlier, or in this case, this is a mason bee, so each of her cells is going to be separated by mud. So this is the number of cells, or her total reproductive output. And in this case, as the pesticide residue increased in both cases, the production of queens and the production of reproductive cells decreased. So this isn't necessarily a lethal effect. It's not outright killing the bees, but it is affecting their reproduction and production of queens. So managed honeybees might also be affecting some of these wild bees. And this is uh, an area where there's less research, so we don't know as much about this. But managed bees may compete with wild bees, there's not a lot of evidence that this is contributing to large-scale bee declines, but it might be important for sensitive species or in sensitive areas that don't have a lot of resources where we might expect competition to be more fierce. Managed bees can also spread pathogens and pests to wild bees. And this uh, is particularly true for some of the bumblebees, or we think this might be true for some of the bumblebee species that are declining. In the 1990s, managed bumblebees were shipped between North America and Europe. And there's a hypothesis that that cross-continental movement introduced new pathogen strains to North America that may be affecting some of the native wild bumblebees. So again, these were managed bumblebees that were moved across large areas that may have introduced pathogen strains to the wild bumblebees. So I have a picture here um, of a bumblebee, just to remind you that bumblebees are also managed. And then, of course, we have the managed honeybee. Uh, so both of these can spread pathogens or pests to wild bees. And finally, these uh, managed bees, in areas where they're non-native, so, for example, the European honeybee is non-native to the United States where it's used, they may preferentially visit exotic or invasive plants and facilitate the spread of those exotic or invasive plants, which could result in the decline of native plants for native wild bees. 
So these are areas of increasing research. As I mentioned, there's uh, not necessarily a large body of evidence to suggest that any of these are contributing to large-scale wild bee declines. And managed bees are very important, so I don't want to get the message across that they are entirely bad. They are important for crop pollination, they're important for honey production, uh, but it may be important to monitor the pests and pathogens in those managed bee colonies to make sure they're not spreading them to wild bees and also to reduce the movement of those managed colonies across large geographic areas. So invasive plants, these might also have effects on native wild bees. So some invasive plants like grasses can take over areas and not provide many floral resources for bees. So they displace floral resources for bees and reduce the resources available. Other plants, however, other invasive plants do provide flowers to bees. In some cases, this might have a positive impact on the native wild bees, although there have been some studies that have found that invasive exotic plants are actually toxic to native bees. So those bees did not evolve with those plants, and the plants might actually be detrimental to their health, even if they visit them. So just like humans, we don't always eat what's good for us. Bees may be attracted to flowers. They don't know that those flowers are detrimental, that they might be toxic, they might affect their behaviors. Uh, so invasive plants in some cases can provide floral resources and sometimes that can have a positive effect on native wild bees, but in other cases not. So they may be in some, in some contexts uh, affecting the native wild bees. And finally, climate change. So climate change can change overall floral density. So in hotter, warmer climates, in hotter, drier climates rather, in hotter, drier climates, we might expect lower floral density. So overall floral density is reduced. But climate change can also change plant ranges, and it may not change bee ranges to the same extent. So there's a spatial mismatch. Plants and pollinators are not changing in the same way. It can also change the timing of emergence, changing the timing of emergence of plants, changing the timing of emergence of pollinators, and again, not in the same way. So this creates a sort of plant-pollinator mismatch. Plants are blooming when the pollinators aren't around, pollinators are emerging when the plants aren't around, and their ranges are changing in different ways. And that's what this uh, chart here shows, that as uh, temperature increases, the emergence time of pollinators changes more drastically than that of plants. So you get this sort of separation in time. And that may increase in the future. And finally, climate change could affect the nutritional value of plants. So again, under a hotter, drier climate, those plants might not produce as much nectar, and the nectar chemistry could change. And the same could be true for pollen as well. So there are various factors that could be affecting native wild bees, and we know that some native wild bees are declining. So what could be done about that? And again, I want to end on a positive note. There are a lot of conservation efforts that are going on right now. So the uh, White House in 2016 put out a national plan, and this was really the first ever plan of its type. It focused mostly on honeybees, reducing honeybee colony loss, but also put forth a plan to increase monarch butterfly numbers and to restore or enhance millions of acres of land for pollinators. Of course, we're under a new administration now, and so as political administrations change, that's that's just part of life, that's what happens, but it's, it's not really clear how much of this will continue to go forward. And this wasn't necessarily mandated, it was more a, a plan of action, um, putting forth some support for plans of action to be taken in the future. So hopefully uh, these kinds of things will continue and action will actually be taken. States have also followed and produced their own pollinator plans. North Dakota was one of the first, so this is an example of North Dakota's pollinator plan. Again, focused a little more on honeybees, but did include some native wild bee action. Uh, and Florida has also produced a honeybee protection program, so this is entirely specific to honeybees, um, but they've, they've produced one here. And so there are a lot of uh, really great efforts being taken to monitor honeybees uh, and to uh, look at their health and to conserve them in different ways. So there are conservation programs for farmers in particular. The Conservation Reserve Program is one of those. And so the Conservation Reserve Program provides funding for farmers to take sensitive land and land that's not very productive out of agricultural production. So it's 
not going to be used for agriculture, and often then it will provide resources for pollinators and other organisms. So this is the amount of acreage enrolled in that conservation reserve program throughout the United States. You can see that it's more in the western states. Again, that's probably where you're more likely to have land that's not very productive. So farmers may be more compelled to take that land out of production and use it for conservation. Uh, there are also smaller um, programs and pots of money available, not just to take land out of production, but actually to put it into pollinator habitat. So this is an example of a farm in Montana that put in pollinator habitat in between these grain fields. And there are things that can be done locally in your backyard. So there are sort of three main areas. Bees need flowers, they need nest habitat, and they need protection from toxins. So in terms of floral resources, bees need a diversity of blooming plants throughout the year. And in general, native plants are better for native bees, although again, some invasive plants can provide a lot of great floral resources for bees. Also, male fertile plants. So some ornamentals are male sterile, meaning they don't produce pollen. And plants that don't produce pollen, they can still be used for nectar, but they're going to have limited value. They don't produce that pollen that bees need. So native plants, male fertile plants, and planting in clumps, which for most gardeners is, is pretty easy. Uh, this is more true if you're going to be putting in a large prairie or a large area of pollinator conservation. Having really dense floral displays attracts bees. They don't want to have to forage over very large areas for scattered flowers here and there. So in terms of spreading out the bloom and maintaining bloom throughout the entire year, a lot of trees and shrubs are early blooming plants, ornamentals as well whereas many of the wildflowers are late blooming plants and ornamentals as well can be late blooming. So an example of a late blooming wildflower would be a sunflower. In Florida, there's the swamp sunflower. Um, and this is an example, uh, Walter's um, viburnum of a tree or early blooming tree or shrub. For nesting resources, the bees that nest below ground need well-drained soil, which is not really a problem in Florida. Most of the soil here drains pretty well. They also like relatively bare and sunny soil, and most importantly, soil that doesn't have a lot of disturbance, so soil that's not tilled or dug up. You can recognize bee nests uh, from or with the naked eye, so you can see holes, and that's where the bees have nested. So they're not necessarily hard to see, um, but often we're not looking for them. You can also put out above-ground nests. So these come in many different shapes or forms. You can get wood blocks that have holes drilled into them. You can also put out reeds, uh, bamboo or other, for bees, the above ground nesters. And there are even some bumblebee colony above ground nests that um, you can put out. So a word of caution about these, especially these wood blocks, pests and pathogens can build up inside of them. Um, and so they, and also I should say that many of them have been found to have wasps more so than bees. So it's, it's sort of an issue of if you build it, will they come? Uh, you, you can put them out there, but you might not get what you want. So many, many homeowners or gardeners put them out and are surprised by how many wasps are nesting and not bees. Uh, things like this, if you put these out, uh, that can be better in that um, these could just be put out for a single season. You can wait until the bees emerge, and then you can collect them and throw them away. And so then you don't have that buildup of the pests and pathogens that you get with these wood blocks that are left out for, for long periods of time. This is an example of a bee hotel. So some people have really gone all out. Uh, so bees, are, bees come in different body sizes, as you probably saw. And so in a bee hotel like this, you'll often have cavities of different sizes. So smaller holes or smaller cavities for smaller bodied bees and larger ones for larger bodied bees. In terms of protection from pesticides, uh, restricting insecticide use in a variety of forms. So in particular, avoiding spraying plants when they're in bloom. And also limiting systemic insecticides that will remain within the plant over a long period of time. If you're using something with a limited residual activity, meaning it's not active over a long period of time, and you're spraying it outside of bloom, then it will likely not affect the bees who, that will forage then when the plant is in bloom. So not spraying plants in bloom, limiting the systemics or the ones with long residual activity. If you are spraying in bloom, spraying at dusk or in low wind, when bees are less likely to be active and avoiding drift. 
and of course considering certain alternatives to insecticides and pesticides more broadly. And herbicides can also have effects, not just direct effects, direct effects, but indirect effects by limiting flowers. So if you're spraying herbicides and reducing floral resources for bees, that will uh, potentially affect them. So I want to point out that there are a number of resources available, both to learn more about this topic, and then there's also some really cool citizen science programs. So the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation is one of the largest nonprofit organizations devoted to this topic. Uh, there's, uh, and, but other invertebrates as well, not just bees. There's also the Pollinator Partnership. This is the website for my lab. And uh, this is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. They um, help a lot of farmers put in those conservation programs that I talked about before, those conservation plantings. And there are some really cool citizen science programs going on right now. Some of them uh, you monitor for bees in your own yard and you can upload pictures. Uh, the Great Sunflower Project, you plant sunflowers so everyone's using the same plant. And then you put those plants in your yard and you monitor the bees that come to it. And these are national projects. Uh, and then there was a project started a little while ago by, I believe he was a PhD student at UF, so I'm not sure how much is still going on here, but he had uh, people put out those nest blocks, so those wood blocks, and monitor which bees were nesting in them. And so there are some citizen science programs going on, not just with the flowers, but also with the nesting resources to monitor what bees are nesting in what types of habitat uh, and the diversity of bees that can be found in these nesting blocks. So there's some really cool citizen science going on if you're interested in monitoring or helping uh, and some resources to get more information. And with that, I, think I, have a, I don't have a thank you slide. With that, thank you, <laughs> and I would be happy to take questions. <laughs>